everybody and thanks for getting back so punctually. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting session. Many of you know, I think, that the World Economic Forum has created, I think, called the Global Redesign Initiative, which was in part driven by the financial crisis and the need to, to really look at what are the gaps in how we manage our affairs globally, which could allow such a dramatic breakdown to happen in high finance in the same way it's happened over in earlier years in public health and insecurity and many other areas. But the second motive for doing this was the sense that there was a really profound power shift going on in the world, that we were seeing the rise of new powers uh, and uh, the eclipse of older ones, and that there was a new order, a rebalancing of power, which would have implications for international institutions and their governance, and for a whole host of political and economic issues. Now, of course, one of the top candidates for a seat at the new top table, uh, already with a seat at the G20, is India. But I think the question we're going to look at this afternoon is, how's India going to exercise that new power? Uh, is it ready for it? Does it have a view uh, of what its particular uh, position and, 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 and influence is going to be on, on global matters? Uh, and so perhaps in, the, in more informal language than the language of a WEF program, the question is, is India ready for prime time? Uh, and um, uh, I'm delighted that we've got such a great panel to discuss, d dis dis discuss this. Um, I'm going to eat, uh, uh, let me just quickly introduce the panelists. Um, I think all of us know and an impossible number of us are friends with Shashi Taror, who uh, combines a huge circle of friends and supporters here in India with many abroad, and he and I have been friends and colleagues for more decades than I would certainly like to admit, and certainly more decades than Shashi would admit. Um, the ever youthful politician has actually been in the UN for much longer um, than, than, than perhaps people know. Um, but we are also joined with, with, for, for, with four very distinguished, sorry, three very distinguished discussants. Uh, Rahul Bajaj, who's uh, chairman of Bajaj Auto and a member of parliament and a long, long time friend and supporter of the forum, both here in India and in Davos. Uh, Ajay Chibber, who uh, is another old friend and colleague of mine from both the World Bank and he's now at an organization that has a particular place in my heart, UNDP, where he's uh, the assistant administrator and director for Asia. And Pratap Mehta, uh, president and chief executive officer of the Center for Policy Research. And I've seen enough of him during the last few days to know that he's a great think tanker with the uh, uh, always the sort of provocative remark to prick uh, any emerging consensus uh, or a sense of complacency which might develop. Uh, so let's get straight into it, and Shashi has agreed to, to lead off with uh, an answer to my question, is India ready for prime time? Thank you, Mark, and uh, I think if that was the only question, the answer would be very easy to give. Yes, and here we are. That's why you're all here, I'm assuming. But uh, I'd like to, given the the description of this of this program today and the materials we've all been given. I'd like to talk a little bit about how we see global redesign, and I'd be very happy to address specifics of our own role uh, in discussions as we move on, because clearly we're talking about uh, redesigning the globe in a, in a very different uh, world from that in which the post-Cold War shape was given uh, in 1945. We're living in a world of paradox. There is simultaneously a phenomenon of convergence where you've got all the forces of globalization that you all know about, I don't need to repeat, increasing in a sense of mutual interdependence, uh, all of these things pulling us together, while at the same time there are the forces of disruption, of intolerance mounting uh, in various parts of the world, of the so-called, though we don't like the term, clash of civilizations, of terrorism, including some we have intimately experienced in this country, these are all forces pulling us apart. And both of these are happening together at the same time at a time 
when we are clearly in the midst of a multipolar world, a world order in which it is manifestly clear, as it should have been for some time already, that the world's challenges are such that no one country or one group of countries, however rich or powerful they may be, can possibly meet them alone. So uh, when Mark and I were at the United Nations, we used to speak of the world facing problems without passports. And this is obviously the case. I mean, the major problems facing the world, whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, international economic relations, refugee movements, human rights issues, food security, energy security, uh, uh, nuclear uh, threats, proliferation, terrorism. I mean, I can go on, drug abuse. The lists are so long, and every single one of them, by definition, transcends borders. It's not a question of one country. Uh, doesn't affect only one country. Can't be solved only by one country. And so it's become pretty obvious that we're living in a world in which global solutions are increasingly necessary for all sorts of global problems. This is why the notion of global governance is in fact not just one for the abstruse political science textbooks. It's very real. It's something we all have to experience and live with in the tangible real world. That's what make, makes international organizations and multilateral grouping so important uh, to us in India. And so when we speak of global redesign, as this panel speaks of, the structure, the process, the effectiveness of global institutions has to take a, a center stage. Uh, it's very clear that the institutions we have uh, reflect the geopolitics and the global economics of 1945 and not of 2009. Uh, I don't want to belabor the point because everyone here is so familiar with the elements, but there is no question that uh, if you just take one example, and the, perhaps the most obvious one here, the composition of the United Nations Security Council, you actually have five permanent members who have that position because they happen to have won a war 62 years ago. I mean, is that a good enough reason anymore to have a, a veto over international peace and security questions in the world today? Uh, what about the overall composition of the Security Council itself? Fond though I am of Mark and his fellow Europeans, Europe with 5% of the world's population occupies 33% of the seats in the council. And so on and so forth. I can give you more figures. The, the, very, comp the very size of the council in numbers. I mean, we have uh, a United Nations was established with 11 Security Council members out of a total membership of 51. Today it's 15 out of a total UN membership of 192. So it's gone from 22% of the members having a voice in the council to fewer than 8%. So both in absolute numbers and in percentages, more and more countries feel that their voices aren't heard in the process of international decision making at the high table. It's simply an illustrative example, and we can go on about this, but to make the point clearly that reform is overdue. Uh, the same applies to the General Assembly, which we see as the legitimate and principal legislative body of the international system. Um, the Economic and Social Council needs great strengthening to be a, a true uh, vehicle for development policy making across international boundaries. The UN agencies, including the one that Ajay now represents and that Mark used to head, um, they also need a, a, a strong, new, fresh look. And all of these things are issues on which we have views, we have a voice, we've made a contribution. In fact, we've made contributions to every one of the institutions I've mentioned, and we would very much like uh, to, to weigh in on the future direction of these bodies. The same thing would apply to reform of the international financial institutions. Uh, clearly, the time has come for a new global financial architecture. Uh, if anything, the recent financial crisis of the last year and a half has simply highlighted how inadequate these international institutions are. The G20 summit in Pittsburgh in September of this year was a good start in the right direction. It seems to have set in process, set in motion, uh, a process to redesign this international financial and economic architecture. And we are pleased that it's now the G20 and no longer the G7 or G8 that declares itself to be the premier forum for international economic cooperation. And that, of course, makes it also a major platform for North-South dialogue, which wasn't possible in the old G8 format. Uh, the reform of the Bretton Woods institutions, another corollary. Uh, again, the G20 said some interesting things about that. They've talked about a shift, they mandated a shift of at least 5% in the IMF's quota, the quota share from developed countries to developing and emerging market economies without affecting the existing share of the poorest countries. And they've also mandated a shift of at least 3% in the World Bank's voting uh, powers, which is interesting because right now Belgium uh, has as much voting strength as China in the World Bank, which is 
uh, I think one might add slightly odd in terms of the way in which the global financial uh, architecture is organized. This is, a, in our view, a significant development. It's only a first step. Our objective remains, uh, along with many others, uh, that of developing parity between the developed countries on the one hand and the developing and emerging market countries on the other. But at least we're finally moving in that direction after many decades of refusing to budge. Uh, and I might add in, in brackets that the multilateral and regional development banks uh, are equally badly off. They need additional resources, they need adequate resources if they're going to make any difference in the regions where they are. Uh, briefly, a word as well about, uh, you know, without affecting the old shibboleth of non-alignment, we are increasingly moving to a world of, no, of multi-alignment. That is that we are finding ourselves participating in lots of little groupings which bring a number of countries together amongst common areas of shared interest. So we have IBSA with Brazil and South Africa, but we also have BRIC with Brazil, Russia, and China. We are members of the United Nations, of course, and of the non-aligned movement and of the G77, but we are also active in a tiny little grouping called the IOR ARC, which stands for the Indian Ocean Rim Countries Association, a grouping of just 18 countries, but from three continents united by the mere fact that their, ocean, their shores are washed by the Indian Ocean. Uh, and we feel that all of this is part of the ways in which in today's world we must participate and engage. We don't want to see ourselves being boxed in only into one formula. There are various ways and various collections of interests and countries through which we can do, that, do our work. Uh, I'm anxious to, to keep this brief, so I shall, I shall end there. You've heard Indian foreign policy spokesmen for decades saying that we're animated by the principle of Vasudeva Kutambakam, <coughs> whole world is one family, and that's, that's still fundamentally true. But within that whole world, we do believe the time has come to restructure uh, the roof to open up a few more doors uh, of this one family so that the members of the family can intermingle together on more equal terms, but at the same time with a consciousness that we all live under one roof. And that famous Tristwood Destiny speech that every Indian probably knows by heart, Jawaharlal Nehru memorably talked about his dreams being not only for India, but for the world. And he said that, uh, that uh, this is a world that is being increasingly knit together. Peace, he said, is indivisible but so too is freedom, so too is prosperity, and so increasingly, he warned, is disaster in this one world of ours. And those words spoken in 1947 are even truer today, 62 years later. And it's from that spirit that Indian foreign policy seeks to engage with the kind of global architecture that we think is ripe for redesign. Thank you. Shashi, thank you very much indeed. That's really set it up very, very well. Uh, but what you've done is you know, make the case how these institutions should be reformed to make space uh, for India. You've pointed to the uh, changes in the global order, both the threats and uh, the emergence, if you like, of what you describe as multi-alignment versus non-alignment. Not versus, in addition to. Or in addition to, in addition to. Uh, but I think what we've still got to answer, and the other three get the first shot at it, and you'll want to come back on it, is of course, now that you get that seat at the table, how do you use it? Uh, and so uh, I'm going to ask each of the three speakers who uh, are going to sort of focus as examples on uh, particular issues close to their own hearts uh, to very much try and describe the kind of leadership that they see India exercising in these, uh, these different areas. Uh, Mr. Bajaj, you're going to start, I think. So. Uh, Shashi talked about it being a one, one world, and that's a great objective, and that's where we should go. But I think we recognize that uh, in this world, there are about 200 countries, each with its own interests, or uh, each group with their own interest. And uh, I'm not a minister, so I can say what I like. Uh, <laughs> oh, I did too. <laughs> yeah, but then you say, I don't get into trouble. <laughs> But no, more seriously, uh, what I see as a citizen or as an industrialist or as a member of parliament is uh, that the obvious statement first, we all have to work for our interest, our legitimate national interests. Second, to successfully do that in shaping the global, in the future global shape where India can cooperate, we have to be domestically strong. If we are not dom domestically strong, 
whatever we try, the world is not going to listen to us. And that's the difference we see after our 1991 liberalization. Even then it took time for people to know what's happening, for us to become stronger, Indian industry to get confident. For the last seven, eight years, uh, to become a little bit at least, not too much, a season for India, which uh, I used to go, I've been going 32 years to divorce every year, but you know, they were polite. But until a few years ago, you could come and you could go. But now they want you to come, and they want to come here, some of our friends are here. So you have to be domestically strong, which is a separate story by itself. We have had three days of discussions on that. The third thing uh, is uh, my personal view. There's a big conflict, a balance between moral standard. India is a land of the Buddha, 5,000 years of history and culture, Gandhi, Nehru's internationalism. We can't forget what's morally correct. But then there's a balance to be drawn between that and uh, our, again, legitimate interests. And sometimes, unfortunately, these can be in conflict. Myanmar being one example. We don't like dictatorship. At least I don't. But if we say so openly and behave like that, then others, including our great friend China, uh, is uh, getting its hands on everywhere. Latin America, Africa, Asia. But that's not my subject today. So what do we do? And that's one example. There are many examples like that. In fact, China is the best example, apart from military might, uh, the economic strength argument. G8 became G20. I don't know what we are doing there, but I hope it doesn't become G2, which people have started talking about. So why? One, military strength. I'm not particularly fond of that for India, uh, except to have adequate deterrent. But second, economic strength. Then the third point, general point I would like to come to, where I think again, I may have my reservations about China versus India, but I would rather follow their policy. Whether it's WTO, and that will be my example, or climate change. Our negotiators, and I'm being very general, we talk tough, body language is tough, shrill voice, rhetoric. Sometimes we retreat very fast. They talk very diplomatically, very sweetly. Better still, they don't talk at all. WTO, till recently, they didn't talk at all. Uh, uh, from Doha time. And uh, so let's, I would be very polite, like in industry, when I used to talk to my unions, till my sons threw me out of the business and said, you become chairman. Uh, uh, I used to talk very politely to our union leaders. Please, I don't want to strike, la, 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 la. But I didn't give in on anything which I thought was wrong. Maintain our interest. Uh, the uh, example, because my time will be up, I don't get as much time as Shashi did. Uh, no. The example is WTO, but climate change is an exactly similar uh, example. We are the bad boys in the world's eyes. Ever since Doha, Maron's time, forget Jaitley was all right, uh, then uh, now with Kamal Nath's time, uh, uh, you are spoiling everything on agriculture, on special safeguard, on this. Uh, when the G20 was formed first in Cancun, I remember the Financial Times articles. I remember what Zolik said, whom I know a little bit. I know what Pascal Lamy said, whom I know also a little bit, not as much as these gentlemen know them. Uh, and they didn't like us at all. But sorry, I have no time to talk about it. I think we are all guilty to some extent. We, in the give and take, we have to also give. But we are nowhere near as guilty, I'm talking trade at the moment, and also climate change, but I'm talking trade, as we are made out to be, partly the way we talk, partly the language, or the what have you. Uh, agriculture is a good example. What does Japan, what is Europe, and what is America do, especially US and France? Germany, UK are okay as far as I'm concerned. But France and this, half a million, a million farmers, their livelihood is more important than 600 million Indians. I don't understand that. And I'm sorry to say, ladies and gentlemen, I will never understand that. Uh, so we have to shape a new world, keeping in mind what Shashi said about one world, the good of the world. But that's a long ways off. First, India's interests, legitimate interests. We have never had imperialistic powers. We have never encroached on anybody's territory. But we are the bad boys in everything. Sorry, per capita income, 7% of America, 30% of China. And we are the bad boys. Cap it. Eight years, 
Bush administration doesn't sign Kyoto, but they are the good guys because we are not covered and China is not covered. I mean, I can go on. So we will shape the world. Now we have a stronger government, but I must say I don't like 206 as much as I like 272. 130 was a disaster. This is much better, but I want 272, 273 out of the 543 members of parliament. But I want a, another national party, BJP, to have another 150 or 200. Otherwise, these guys get arrogant. So yeah. we want a strong opposition and a strong government, and that's the way we are moving now, and I think India will do very well. I'm very confident of that. Thank you, Mark. Rahul, thank you. That was fantastic. You, you, your sons should have pushed you out 30 years earlier so you could have had a career in politics. <laughs> you, you, you're a natural at it. That was very powerful and I think impressed everybody. Uh, Ajay, uh, you're going to, I think, pick up climate change, actually, and it'll be interesting to see whether you agree with that characterization of the debate. Yes, thank you, Mark. And uh, it's great to be here with you. And I also want to welcome everybody who's from outside Delhi to Delhi. While I don't live in Delhi anymore, it is my city. I grew up here, and in fact, you have a long association with Shashi, but he and I go back even further. We went to college here together, and it's so good to see him back here and having won the election and now minister in the government. Congratulations to you, Shashi. Um, and um, I, I thought what I would do, if it's okay, Mark, is you've given me three minutes, so I would do three propositions. Proposition one is, and I think Shashi already alluded to it, which is India is now somewhat grudgingly being given a seat at the table. And the main manifestation of that is the G20 or G22. I, I always get the numbers mixed up because I think Holland and Spain are also counted in, so it's, it's always a bit confusing. But G20 is good because G20, the G7 had one Asian country. The G20 has at least five or six, depending on how you count who is an Asian country, which is an Asian country. But anyway, it's a good uh, development. But it's still a very, very grudging, and as uh, Mr. Bajaj said, we don't really, the jury is still out on how effective G20 will be. And of course, it behoves India to play a responsible role in making it more effective, but we'll still have to see. And I think Shashi has already pointed out the fact that one, a country which is one-sixth of the world's population is not a permanent member of the Security Council. We have some small share shifts that are probably likely to take place in the international financial institutions that Mark and I have been working in for many years. But we know that the top positions of many of these institutions are taboo to people from our part of the world, still are taboo to people from our part of the world. So if you can see in this conference so many capable Indians that have reached such top positions in so many international companies and in so many other uh, fora around the world, why is it possible that in these top financial institutions and, and perhaps also at the UN, why and particularly, at the, I mean, I didn't mean this one on you, Shashi, <laughs> per, per, per se, but, but certainly at the inst financial institutions that I'm very familiar with, it's very hard for an Indian to reach uh, the top position. So there's been a grudging acceptance of India, but there's still a long way to go. And I think the world is actually missing uh, a lot of good Indian talent and good Indian ideas by not including India in this, uh, in this uh, place. My second proposition is that India projects really soft power. It's, it's not a hard power country. It has no territorial ambitions on anybody. It has never had them. Um, I think even a Chinese ambassador said it best when he said, 
that for 20 centuries, India conquered China with ideas and with its uh, learning, and never a single soldier ever crossed the border. So India projects really soft power. And I think it is therefore a, a, a new power that is coming, a new, a new emerging country that's coming, that really uh, will play a major role in global architecture, global design, global institutions, because it is for the first time that you will have a power in that which is, whose main strength comes from soft power, not from hard power. <coughs> so I think that's the second uh, proposition that I want to put, and whether it is on trade, whether it is on climate change, whether it's on nuclear, nuclear disarmament, it, as, as, as Mr. Bajaj said, we need a nuclear deterrence. We, are not, we don't want a nuclear deterrence for any aggressive intention on anybody, but we, may want, we, we do have one. We are a nuclear power now, but it's mainly for deterrence. So, so that's my second uh, proposition, that India is not a spoiler. India will be a constructive power in any global architecture that is emerging in the future. India, Indians may be argumentative, and we have uh, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Amartya Sen, who's written an entire book about how we love to argue. In fact, he's made it a virtue because he said the bedrock of this country's democracy lies on the fact that we love to argue. And we can argue the same from both sides of a proposition equally effectively. And of course, what happens in global negotiations is that if you keep arguing, you look like you're the recalcitrant party and you're the spoiler. And that's been the case when it's gone to trade negotiations. We're not the one that uh, scuppered the Doha round, but we, we took some heat for it. We're not the one that is the major polluter or emitter in the world. We're far away from that. And yet, when it comes to any discussion on climate change, India suddenly emerges to be the recalcitrant party in those negotiations. So I think uh, it is important for us in India to realize that arguing for the sake of arguing is probably counterproductive, but it's also equally possible for the rest of the world to realize that this argumentative Indian attitude is still coming with not uh, aggressive intentions, not spoiling spoiler intentions, but basically to present a point of view in any discussion. The third proposition I have is think global, but also act regional. That it is important for India as a big country in the world to be a big player on global issues, but it is equally important to get your backyard uh, right as well. And I think here, India can do some homework. If you look at intra-South Asian trade as a region, as a sub-region, it is amongst the lowest in the world. If you look at major climate change issues like uh, the Himalayan ice melt, there's very little discussion really going on between all the countries that will be affected Shashi already mentioned the Indian Ocean. I mean, there's been some attempts there, but really not good enough. And when we look at how other sub-regions look at ASEAN and how much progress they have been able to make on some of their regional issues. So I think as the biggest power in this part of the world, it is perhaps India's responsibility to be able to bring everybody together. The subcontinent is one big house that was divided for a variety of reasons, but there's no reason why um, more cooperation cannot take place um, if, and I think if India was to be the country that stays at eight to nine percent growth that the Prime Minister talked about, 
It's a rising tide that will lift all the boats in the sub-region as well. So India has a very important role to play in getting the sub-region right. And if India actually wants to play a bigger role in global cooperation, it may, it may at the same time have to pay enough attention to the regional issues as well. So I think, let me end here, Mark, by just quoting uh, a British historian, uh, Toynbee, who said that this story which had a Western beginning must have an Indian ending for the future of mankind. Thank you. Well, well, thanks, Ajay, very much. That was very, very powerful. And I can see that you and Chashi went to the same university. <laughs> um, the better debater. <laughs> uh, Prata, I, my, my introduction of you at the beginning, that which that you could prick uh, holes in consensus. I'm not sure how much consensus we've got. We've, um, you're going to have to tell us and exactly where you're going to kind of target your, your attacks because we're counting on you to prevent any complacency setting in here. Being here is no past association with Shashi Tharoor. <laughs> but um, more seriously, I mean, I, I think there's consensus on two propositions. One, that India's success itself will be a contribution to global stability. Uh, second, that the architectonic of the world order that we are likely to see in the coming years is not going to be centered as the post-war architecture was on a central sort of architecture. It is instead going to be a series of overlapping institutions and improvisations which will have to be negotiated with, with great deal of intelligence, nimbleness and subtlety. But I think underlying the second proposition is a proposition that I would take to be characteristic of what it means to be a responsible power. And that is how you understand the nature of power itself. Right? What do I mean by this? Right? Uh, what I mean by this is, 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 is the following, which is I think, I think you know, too often we get caught up in our own categories about hard versus soft power. Uh, are you powerful because you have veto power at the Security Council. I mean, these are also, in a sense, very formal, formalistic ways of talking about power, right? Uh, I think the big contribution of India to global thinking can be about the nature of power itself. And if you look at almost all major global crises, right, or distortions, they happen because powers either overestimate their power or underestimate the power. Great powers coming with the illusion that they can remake the world in their own image. Classic source of distortion in international politics that still continues and is likely to continue in our region for the next five to 10 years. Right? So I think the crucial thing is, does India come to whatever forum it comes to with a clear-eyed assessment of what power can achieve and what kinds of power can achieve what kinds of things? That requires, first and foremost, great intellectual clarity. It does not require getting caught up in a status game about you know, how many votes do you have, how many shares you have, and so forth. Those, those matter, but, but only in a sort of instrumental sense. And I think India's track record on thinking about the character of power in international relations has, by and large, been pretty good, actually. I think it's one of the things we are given less, less, less credit for. Non-alignment was not in, a, in that sense you know, ab about a sort of ideological mantra. It really was about the character of power in international relations. Uh, second, it is also going to be a feature of the crises that India faces, and the world faces at least one, one set of crises, where the classical instruments of power Right, namely collective action by the UN and so forth, are not very likely to take you very far. And I think that's the kind of crisis we face on our doorstep, Pakistan, Afghanistan, terrorism. I mean, these really require engagement with all kinds of actors that we hadn't imagined, right, would be central to geopolitics 10 or 15 years ago, right? The second kind of crises we face are genuinely global crises. And they're genuinely global in the following sense, which is that if you think of all the big issues, trade, nuclear disarmament, climate change, by and large, they cannot be solved if the major powers of the world continue to think within the paradigm of national interest in which they, continue, in which they are thinking at present. 
uh, because that is the paradigm that has produced deadlock in, that, in, 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 in those particular areas, right? Frankly, climate change is one of those areas where if we continue to think in the paradigm of our conventional national interests all over, right, there is no outcome but a deadlock. Right? And I think responsible powers in the 21st century will be powers that can, on these kinds of issues, right, move their own conception of what counts as national interest into more new and imaginative direct directions. And I think, I think on this front, all the countries of the world have a lot of domestic work to do in their own politics, right? Uh, but I think India is certainly, I think, I think, I think, I think capable of, 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 of doing that. And I think we will see the debate on climate, 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 climate change, uh, climate change uh, opening up. Uh, so to sum up, I mean, I think, if, you know, to go back to the question, which is, I think the question of is India ready, I think can be posed in two registers. Sometimes it can be posed in a register, particularly in the West, where the question is a trap. And the question is a trap because what it says is, we don't want to do the things that it will take to solve particular problems, whether it's terrorism, whether it's climate change, and so forth. By the way, can you do it for us? And if that is the expectation of India, the answer is no. India is not in that position, and no country in the world will be singly in that position. But if the question is posed, can India bring to its understanding of complex global processes a clarity right, that great powers of the past have obscured because they misunderstood the character of their own power? Right? And I think that is the history of the United States, for example, in the last 15 to 20 years, and I, I suspect will continue to be for, for the next few. Right? But if you can bring clarity to that question, that will be its most important contribution to international relations. And I think that India is capable of doing provided it does not see international relations as this big competition for status, right? Because there's nothing that distorts your own, your, your own clarity than a politics of self-esteem. Questions from the floor. A lot of very interesting ideas have been raised there. Some overlap, some don't. Uh, soft power versus hard power. Uh, speak softly, but carry a big stick. I mean, a lot of concepts have been uh, put out here. Um, uh, would you like a first go at some of them before we, we open it up? Thank you, Mark. No, I welcome that. I do want to say, just taking uh, scribbling notes as the others were speaking, Raul Bajar is probably going to be horrified when I tell him that I agree with him. I mean, I, I don't see anything in what he said that I would, I would wish to disagree with, so I'll move on from there. Ajay's uh, propositions, um, are largely fine. I mean, we, we clearly um, are not interested in projecting hard power as such in the world, and we, we would want to be a constructive player. Um, and we are very interested in thinking globally and acting regionally. Uh, one of my concerns, one of our concerns collectively, has been that it has not been for lack of India trying that some of the regional initiatives have been stillborn. I'm going to give you one example. Um, India and Pakistan are in this extraordinary situation. I think it's a unique situation in the world. Well, we have extended most favored nation trading status 12 years ago, and they have yet to reciprocate. So it's a one-sided MFN, which really is quite bizarre in the annals of international trade. So there are, unfortunately, uh, political compulsions on the part of our neighbors that have impeded the sort of regional uh, uh, collaboration that we would like to promote, and that Ajay rightly points out is essential within this region, that there is a great deal of win-win possible if, for example, a trade between India, and direct trade between India and Pakistan, as opposed to smuggled by Dubai, uh, could not just increase, but quadruple or quintuple in the next year or two. But uh, while citizens of both countries would benefit, some of those who have a vested interest in hostility might find that a problem. And this is, this is a, a source of frustration on our side. But that brings me back to, to Pratap's very interesting and provocative notion at the end about, um, about uh, rethinking the use of power uh, in international affairs and how we understand uh, what our national interests are. It, it's a very interesting idea. I'm not sure it applies across the board to every one of the examples since three were mentioned here, uh, nuclear, trade, and, 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 um, and climate change. You see, one of the things is we have traditionally been willing to look 
beyond a narrow conception of national interest. For example, again, just taking examples, India's involvement in United Nations peacekeeping has involved risking the lives of our young men and women in uniform in places more than half a world away where we had absolutely no political, material, economic, or other interest. We've had Indian soldiers dying in Congo before we had trade relations with Congo. And we've done this simply because we've had throughout a very responsible notion of global citizenship and of the contribution that India should make to upholding world order. So it's not that we are lacking in any way in a capacity to think beyond what is narrowly uh, India's national interest. But then when you come to issues like trade and climate change, you are expecting democratically elected political leaders accountable to their populations to go out and negotiate internationally they cannot be expected to put aside their fundamental responsibilities to the well-being of their own citizens who are also happen to be their own electorate. That's, that's, that's where have to, they have to turn to. So yes, on climate change, we very much want to be part of the solution. We have said repeatedly, we don't see ourselves as part of the problem for all sorts of reasons. Much of it was created by 200 years of industrialization from which we were largely excluded. And even today, with 17.5% of the world's population, India generates about 4% of global emissions. I mean, we aren't in any significant way a principal uh, a cause of the, of the problem. And yet we have a deliberate interest, both for our own people, our own citizens who are suffering some of the consequences, and as a responsible global player in contributing towards the solution. We are approaching the challenge in that way. But having said that, you know, 600 million Indians today are still not connected to electricity. Why should they be denied the right that every American or Australian or Frenchman can take for granted that they will turn a switch on a wall and a light will come on? So we're going to have to do things that do not deprive our people of the basic elements of development that so many other people take for granted, while at the same time urging the world to work with us so we can get from here to there without damaging the global environmental cause. So the transfer of clean air technologies, for example, clean environmental technologies, for example. Uh, working together, uh, Indian scientists, Chinese manufacturers, Western capital, who knows, together in things like new forms of alternative energy, um, mass production of solar panels, who knows? I mean, there are various things that could be done which do not involve saying to your voters, sorry, you guys are never going to get electricity because we've just gone and signed something in Copenhagen that doesn't allow you to develop. So there will always be some conception of national interest in any democracy which involves politicians being accountable to those who put them there and therefore I can't go quite as far as your comment appeared to go in suggesting that we have to rethink uh, all these notions uh, of, of, of self-interest. Uh, we are, after all, organized as a global community of sovereign states. Each state has its own internal uh, logic and its own structures and we have to be responsive to them. Others are. We can't be altruistic at the expense of our own population. Shashi, thank you. Well, time to open this up. Uh, just if you wouldn't mind, as I catch your eye and you, you speak, um, let us know who you are, um, and if there's anyone in particular you want to have answer, please. Geographic neighbors are sort of like family. You can't choose them, but you do have to learn to live with them and possibly even love them. Now, we are surrounded by a particularly um, uncomfortable zone. It's neither friendly nor stable nor secure. And we in India often feel like we've done sometimes enough and often more than enough to reach out to those around us. Um, but the zone around us is nevertheless neither secure nor stable nor friendly, often downright hostile. What more could we be proactively doing to create a more comfortable neighborhood or backyard? It's only in our own interest. Okay, hold that one. We'll get a few more out there, but extremely good question. So, yeah. Thank you. I'm Georg Blume, correspondent for the German weekly Die Zeit here in India. I've been working in China for the last 12 years. China is the one other new player in the world stage. But whenever they do a proposition, they are told they have the wrong political system and nobody, they have to be as diplomatic as you just mentioned before. So that leaves India as the country who can come up with the new ideas and with the new propositions. And what I hear from you is still sounding timid in a way to me. It sounds like you have had 
bad experience with your non-aligned policy in the past, and you're not really daring now to come into the G20 and pick, put at the finger at where the West is, is, is doing bad governance for the world. I feel like when you just point, I clap my hands when you just pointed up 50 million French farmers are more to the world community than 500 million Indian farmers. That's where you point really to the, to the, con to the concrete problem and when you tell us, the West, that doesn't work anymore. But you are timid, you are talking about soft power, notions of uh, international cooperation, structural things, where, you, where you're not really getting moral authority from. And that was, would be my question. Where does India get moral authority from on the world stage? Okay, let's take the lady there, and then we'll, we'll, get, we'll come back, be ready to come back after that. Thank you, um, Minister. I'm Amy Kalsman from the Financial Times. And um, I'd like to ask you, um, today or, in, or yesterday, I believe, um, a Chinese newspaper accused um, India of forgetting the lessons of 1962. And recently, tensions um, along the, um, over Arunachal Pradesh between India and China appear to be um, heating up with things like um, China trying to oppose um, a loan package by the ADB that would have, um, you know, had loans for Arunachal Pradesh. Obviously, this has been a long outstanding dispute, but it had been kind of a cold dispute on the back burner. Suddenly, it seems to be really heating up. And I'd like to ask you, um, what do you think the reason for that is? Why suddenly, um, you know, is this seem to be kind of escalating? Um, I'd also like to ask a second question that's kind of a follow-up on um, Shafali's question about the neighborhood. India may perceive that it's been a very generous neighbor to those around it. I just came back from Bangladesh where I was told that Bangladeshis feel that India is a giant with the heart of a pygmy. And, I, and that many of India's neighbors feel that, in fact, India won't give anything to its much smaller and weaker neighbors um, without looking for something in return. And I've actually heard that also from veterans now retired of the Indian Foreign Ministry. Leaving aside Pakistan, which is obviously a particularly vexed case, I'd like to ask you, do you think India really knows how to be a generous and beneficent neighbor to the much smaller countries? that surround it. Thank you. Well, there we are. Shashi, you can go first, but we'll invite others also to have a word on that. All right. Thank you. Well, three tough and, and good questions. On, on the, the question uh, that Shafali asked and, and Amy's second question, they really tie in together, which is uh, we live in a tough neighborhood. What should India do and do differently? First, uh, I mean, it, it, it's a great line, this giant with the heart of a pygmy, but I don't think the facts and figures would stand up to that. I mean, I, you know, didn't come with a with a fat prepared brief in my hands. So I can't give you exact numbers that you can quote in the FT, Amy. But the fact is that uh, if you look at the track record of India's generosity, if nothing else, in pure dollar terms to all of our neighbours, we have not been found wanting. Uh, time and time again, particularly when our neighbours have had troubles, whether natural disasters, civil wars, conflicts of various sorts, India has been the fastest and the first to come up with relief from tsunami victims to earthquake victims to flood victims, India's been out there. But we've also been generous in writing off loans and granting large sums of money. Uh, I, mean, uh, I need to point to the, the 500 crores announced at the end of the Sri Lankan civil war, the 1.2 billion spent in Afghanistan, entirely on development projects, building roads, uh, trans power transmission lines, hospitals, schools, clinics. That's the sort of stuff we're doing in Afghanistan. So if you look all around in Nepal, the figures are even higher. Uh, my impression is that if there is a perception that we are not sufficiently generous, it would be nice if that perception could be backed up with concrete examples and facts and figures. But I don't disagree that we need to overcome such a perception if it exists at all. And, and our fact, uh, I mean our uh, uh, answer to, to Shafali's question is, what we're trying to do in our neighborhood generally is first be helpful, as I said, whenever help is needed. We're conscious, we're on the spot. We have, by and large, we have the resources, the experience, the ability, the talent to be of assistance. And we tend to go in quickly as long as we're asked to do so. Um, and, and that is something we will do throughout. Second, to maintain these relationships in a way that is sufficiently respectful of the sovereign interests of these states. So people don't think that we're coming down as the heavy breathing giant in the neighborhood. But at the same time, to show that because of our special uh, responsibility that comes with, with size and that comes with uh, 
with, with the size of the economy and everything else, that we are available to do more than perhaps we've done so far, and we'd like to hear from them how we can be helpful to them. Uh, I am intrigued by Amy's sort of bluntness because it's a kind of language we don't hear directly in our diplomatic exchanges uh, from, from these countries. But I do want to say that India is caught sometimes between simply being itself and being misunderstood, or being nice and being misunderstood. And, and some, 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 some of the countries uh, in the region uh, know that they just have to pick up a phone to talk to us, and, and we would encourage them to do that. Now, you're looking for more specific concrete things? <coughs> We are looking at specific projects with every one of our countries, sometimes more than one country. Can you imagine, for example, just as a hypothetical, a meaningful water project that involves Nepal, Bangladesh, and India? Hasn't happened yet, but India, believe me, is not the obstacle to any such discussion. There are things that we can all do together that would be in the interests of all the countries concerned. Um, with some, we have made tremendous progress. In the case of Bhutan, for example, <coughs> the generation of electricity from Bhutanese rivers to be sold to India has now overtaken tourism as the number one contributor to Bhutan's GDP. Again, it's because India helped build those resources for Bhutan. We're happy to do that sort of thing. So I, I do believe that uh, if, as I said, there is reluctance on the other side and they're willing to overcome it, then that perception too can change. Uh, Georg, I think, was the one, right? The, the question about uh, new ideas. I think. Your question, there are certainly political parties in my country who would welcome the tone and assumption behind your question. But the fact is that, uh, that we do believe very much in, in working within a context of international cooperation rather than assertive, uh, assertive nationalism, which appeared to be implicit in your question. If I misunderstood you, uh, do correct me. But um, our role in the world stage, our moral authority comes from a number of things. It comes from the fact that we are a democratically elected government that speaks for one-sixth of humanity, that we come to the world stage with a long record of responsible global citizenship, that we actually participate in pretty much all the global endeavors, negotiations, conferences, peacekeeping operations, you name it, uh, that requires international cooperation. And so we feel that our authority comes not because we're flexing muscle, but because we actually make a contribution that others value. That would be my, my response to you. And, and I. I'm happy to pursue it further, but I haven't fully got the point of it. Finally, on China. Why is there an escalation? I don't know. You work for the media, and the escalation seems to be largely in the media, on both sides of the border. So uh, you tell me why the media suddenly becomes so focused on all of this. As an Indian minister, I shouldn't be responding to a Chinese newspaper report. But let me just say that, broadly speaking, uh, to speak, to invoke, quote unquote, the lessons of 62 and so on is a bit, is a bit silly. Uh, there is no question in our minds that uh, we are far from 1962 and that in any case, history doesn't repeat itself quite that easily. Uh, we are no longer a woefully underprepared military, for one thing, uh, and we are a country which in many ways has moved on in the world since 62. Uh, so that sort of language is not helpful in any international discourse. But at the same time, I, I think it's time we all dial down the temperature a little bit or the volume knob on this, on this uh, series of media exchanges because the fact is that, uh, that India and China have a large and complex relationship which is about far more than the one unresolved problem we have between us on the border. Yes, we have a long unresolved border conflict, but we had, I mean, border dispute, we're talking about it. We've had 13 rounds of talks about it and we in India remain determined to work constructively towards a mutually acceptable outcome. Having said that, we also have huge amounts of trade, $51 billion and counting, and what's more, that trade is, if you discount the IT and IT-enabled services uh, trade we have with America, that trade would make China our number one trading partner in the world. We have Indian companies opening up offices in Shanghai and, and hiring Chinese. We have Huawei opening offices in Chennai and Bangalore and hiring Indians. We have 7,000 Indian students in, chi in China. Indian pilgrims are trudging across to Hindu holy sites of Kailash and Mansarovar every year. Uh, 58,500 business visas to Chinese last year given by India, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a large, complicated relationship with a lot of depth to it, um, and indeed uh, with some areas of convergence, including things like the recent meeting of foreign ministers of India, Russia, and China that we saw in Bangalore a week, 10 days ago. There's a lot of ways in which the two countries intersect and cooperate. Yes, there is one problem uh, whose, uh, shall we say, articulation in recent weeks 
has been a bit of an irritant. But beyond that, to, to escalate it to some sort of imminent uh, hostility or conflict a la 62 is frankly irresponsible. Thank you, Shashi. Hold on, we're just gonna allow the others a chance to come in. Rahul, do you want to come in on that? Uh, surprise and turn Shashi by saying I agree with everything he said. Uh, and I want to repeat what he said because I agree with that. Uh, so again, I repeat, but this is only as a citizen. Uh, not, not, not only is the question of neighbors, unstable as they are. <coughs> Beyond that, we have oil producing countries. You understand what I mean by oil producing countries? I'm not, we are dependent on them for our oil imports and the religion is a situation. And then we have Pakistan and China. So what do I see as a citizen? I see as a citizen that in addition to, to Russia, with whom we've had long-term relationship, including when we were non-aligned, uh, we have to be friendly with the United States, very friendly with the United States. But where I sometimes am slightly uncomfortable is, US very rightly, like all of us, they, each relationship is independent. They have to be friendly with everybody else, with the European countries, the NATO situation there, with Pakistan and with China. And of course, Pakistan and China are very friendly. So the way I see it as a citizen, you see, lap dogs are not respected. So I want to be a friend, but I don't want to be subservient. I don't want to use the language of sovereignty. Of course, sovereignty, of course, we are not going to give up our sovereignty. But with the climate change, whether it's the NPT and CTBT, whether it's WTO, we should not forget our interest. We should do everything we can for climate change, proactively. Jairam Ramesh, I minister said that. But we may not agree to cap, we may not agree to do something under pressure. Because if we succumb to pressure, then we are not friends. When you are subservient in some manner, and then you are not respected. I'm not concerned with status. I'm not concerned with anything of the, I'm only concerned with India's interest and the interest of our citizens, and I'm not a politician. He had to get votes. I don't have to get votes. But I am concerned with uh, my citizens, my co-citizens' interest, and that I have to maintain together with my friendship. That's the only way even the friendship will remain. And lastly, in that connection, I must be seen as correctly strong. Last two years, and I come from Mumbai and Pune, you've had terrorism on the one hand and enough problem with what we call Naxalites and Maoists within the country. Now, without going into detail, no time for that. Terrorism, we just have to defeat. We can't argue, we can't logic, we can't do anything. They come from across the border. They want to hurt us, they want to destabilize us. We have to fight. Whether we succeed or fail depends on how well we do it. In a different context, Shashi said, we are much better prepared than we were in 1962. I don't think we are adequately prepared in totality. We have not been buying things for armed services as much as we should for various reasons, but we are better prepared. So terrorism, we have to fight. Naxalites and Maoists, I don't even differentiate between them. We have to do fight on two grounds. Development, progress, amelioration of poverty, taking care of tribals if they have been ignored. Unless you do that, you can't just keep fighting with a gun. It won't succeed. Uh, you have to do that, but then, all that will take years. It can't be solved tomorrow or two years or three years. Till that time, if the guy picks up a gun, breaks my law, that will not be allowed. The state has to has a responsibility to protect my life and my property. And so then they must be fought compassionately because, because they are weak and they are poor and they've been ignored, but uh, that doesn't mean you can you know, fight with the barrel of the gun. And so that might, we must be strong. We must be seen to be strong, compassionate, compassionate empathic, uh, sympathetic to the weak and to the poor, but uh, weakness, uh, covering ourselves by saying we are nice and sympathetic, but being weak, I don't believe that is a solution. Tata, a view on this quickly, if you don't mind, so we can get some more questions. Yeah, uh, just quickly, uh, just two quick points. One, a clarification on climate change. I didn't mean to suggest that India should unilaterally do it. It's, it's just that we have to, there has to be a global understanding of the structure of that problem, which is different from the one that all countries are bringing to the table. But on China, I think it's important. I mean, I think, I think, uh, um, I think the roadblocks in this relationship are getting more serious. I mean, I don't think it's simply, uh, we like to dismiss times now and as a channel and, you know, 
so it, but, 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 but there are serious roadblocks to this relationship. Yes, it is true that China is our largest trading partner, but in the coming years, we also have the largest number of anti-dumping cases against China. Uh, I think we are going to increasingly have issues about the management of Chinese workers coming along with Chinese investment. Um, the, de the deficit, the character of that trade is still very much adverse to India. Uh, I think there are going to be issues around the transparency of Chinese pricing. So, I mean, let, let, you know, I, I mean, I think even on the trade side, uh, it will help us if we candidly acknowledge that there are these problems. But the two most important things about the Chinese relationship is, one, I think you will find a lot of Chinese intellectuals beginning to say that the one thing that has changed in the last five years is the fact that there's a realization in Asia that democracy does not have as high a growth penalty as people used to assume that it does. And whether we like it or not, India's success does pose larger ideological ramifications for the rest of Asia. Um, and if you notice the People's Daily editorials, it's not actually what they'll do to India. In fact, there's nothing about that kind of aggression. It's, it's really impugning the Indian model that was at stake in those editorials. And I'll, so I suspect you'll get a bit, bit more of that. And Third, we are at a very critical juncture in Tibet. Let's not, let's not sort of avoid mentioning the T word. Uh, and so long as the Dalai Lama is in India, it will be a source of irritant for China. Having said that, I think the fact that since 62, the border has by and large been managed without incident suggests that you know, these tensions will be overcome. But I don't think we should, we should underestimate the fact that there are going to be serious load blocks in this relationship. Thanks. Ajay. Uh, just to add two things. One is that, you know, the stakes are very high for both China and India because if you look at Asia as a whole, 60% or 70% of the world economy 200 years ago was Asian. And if the growth rates of China and India continue at the rate at which they have been going, by 2050, 60 to 70 percent of the world economy will be Asian. So it is in the interest of China and India to make that Asian century happen. And therefore the stakes are very high for avoiding getting into it with each other. That's one thing I want to say. The other thing is um, democracies don't go to war, right? So. What, in my work at the UN, we have seen in the last two years even, all of South Asia is now under democratically elected government. You may quibble about the, how good the election was, uh, how, you know, how fair it was, but today every South Asian country has democratically elected government. And this happened only in 2008. So you have uh, the potential, if you can deepen that democratic process here, you have less of the chance for tension and conflict. The other variable that links with conflict is poverty. Poverty and conflict go together. Uh, and that's empirical around the world. And therefore, more uh, prosperity in India and in the neighborhood of India will lead to less tensions. I can agree with Amy that, and I cover all of Asia in my work, I meet all the governments, and they say exactly what she said, which is, when I visit Bangladesh, I hear the same thing. I don't hear it in Bhutan, and to that extent, Shashi is correct, because Bhutan has used Indian aid to actually go ahead of India. Bhutan ranks higher than India on the UNDP, the Human Development Index. So it's used our so-called generous aid very, very well. Uh, but, you know, that's the reality. I think that what we have to do is lift the region and there will be less tensions. And in that sense, the big country in the region 
must obviously be the more generous one in making sure that that happens. And it's not just here. I mean, look at the United States and Mexico. Whatever the United States might do, the Mexicans will always feel that they were not treated fairly or generously, etc. So it's the same here in our neighborhood, and we have to realize that. Thank Thanks, you. Ajay. That's very helpful. Sir. Hello? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Ambar Chaturvedi from Overseas Infrastructure Alliance. Our question today is, how will India shape future global cooperation? My question is directed to Mr. Bajaj. I would like to tweak this a bit and say, how will India, Inc. shape future global cooperation in context to the way American, Inc. has shaped American foreign policy and American um, views on the global stage? I don't see the comparison between, sorry. Yeah. Hold and get a few more questions out there. Front, two at the front, one, three at the front, one, two, three. Thank you. Uh, Vijay Punusami from Etihad Airways in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I'd like to get some comments from all the panelists and, and possibly from Shashi last on, on this question. Uh, India is the largest democracy in the world, has an incredible track record in terms of international cooperation in the UN system. Shashi, yourself, you're a very articulate, uh, charming and endearing person with an in-depth knowledge of the UN system. Why was it Shashi was not elected Secretary General of the UN? <laughs> yeah, hold, hold on. I may even get advanced on that. No. <laughs> yeah. uh. Hi, I'm from um, Oman in the Middle East, and my question is to the foreign policy experts. Um, the GCC and is trying to woo India to sign an FTA. India is not very FTA-centric um, for various reasons. Do we expect this coming soon? The GCC has, the GCC countries have a, um, a food security issue. India has a energy security issue. Are these trade-offs that can happen into the future? Brad, over here. Thank you. I'm, I'm Brad Adams with Human Rights Watch. Uh, I want to ask you uh, all to talk about why India, because it is the world's largest democracy, it has great traditions, it has a very strong judiciary, it has a constitution that is admirable, it has a Supreme Court that's very active. Why India doesn't have a foreign policy that promotes human rights positively? Uh, when I talk to Indian officials about human rights promotion in Burma or other countries, I usually get two things. One, don't talk to me, you American, because look at Iraq. Um, you know, very, a very defensive kind of approach. I, I, I marched against the Iraq war, so it's fairly ironic to get that back. But I get that a lot. Um, or two, uh, we have to compete with China, and we will lose out to China if we, for example, don't cozy up to the generals in Rangoon because China gets all the contracts. To which I say China will get all the contracts anyway, and it's sort of a dead end, and many people in, in India recognize that. But why not a more positive view of India, you know, a long-term view about where India can go and, and the values it represents and how it can be different and how it can, it can compete positively with China? Sure, you'll lose some places where the lowest common denominator is un, unconditional aid and, and saying nothing from China, but you'll win other places. And, and that's where I'd like to see India in the next decade or two. I think India can play a, a very positive role internationally that it's not playing right now. Okay, hold, we're gonna take one more, which is back here. Hi, I'm Pierre Fitter, and I uh, report for New Sex. My question is to Dr. Mehta and uh, Dr. Tharoor. Um, this, this whole move of India from non-alignment, from non-alignment to non-alignment and multi-alignment, multi I'm wondering if it's an attempt to make India look more benign, less um, less uh, less, uh, less, less dangerous in some ways. And I'm also wondering as a follow-up from that, uh, where do you start drawing the line between being multi-aligned and then diluting your national interest in, in all these global forums? 
Okay, well, again, another great round of questions. And um, uh, I, I think, Pratap, we might start with you and just work our way down this way. I'll just pick on a couple, the one about uh, human rights and the last uh, one, which in some sense is, I think, related. I think the human rights question is a genuinely difficult one. And I agree with you that the responses that you got to your questions are not the right responses. I think the more difficult question, which I think the international human rights movement needs to ask, is really what are the rights kinds of instruments that actually promote sustainable human rights in the long run? And is it the case that right, states like India becoming championing in the region? I mean, of course, we champion the value, right? I mean, I, I, I think that's, that's beyond dispute, right? But is it best done through the power of your own example, or is it best done through active promotion of various kinds? Now, in certain contexts, the second makes sense, but I think those contexts are actually far fewer than often the international human rights movement has acknowledged. And, and we know that, I mean, given, given in sense the context of power within which discourses of human rights are then paced in domestic politics in particular countries, I think you have to be actually very careful about doing it. And I, and I think if there is a genuine argument for India's reticence on that, I think, I think it will take that, that character. So we, you know, um, 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 I, you know, so so I think you know, so I think we should be 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 sort of careful um, uh, about that. On the multi-alignment business, look, I mean, I I don't think it's anybody's case that India is not standing up for its national interest. Uh, I think it's simply the case that the, the objective structure of the world is such that you will need to engage in different dimensions with different actors and actually improvise different kinds of institutions. Uh, I mean, it may very well turn out to be the case that the UN kind of institution is actually not the optimal one and you'll have lots of <laughs> regional arrangements, lots of you know, different kinds of process. So I think, I think, I think you know, the multi-engagement should be seen as part of an intelligent response to increasing your options of the kinds of institutional arrangements that you have to actually sp solve false specific problems. Uh, but the one question I think India is going to have to confront, we'd be kind of skirting around, because we, we, do, we are operating in an assumption that international relations is a zero-sum game. At the moment, we can improve relations with everybody, right? What if the world doesn't turn out to be like that in two or three years' time, where you actually have to make genuine choices about alliances? The interesting thing about the Chinese is that they think India has made the choice, no matter how much we may project that we are not getting in the middle of a sound Sino-US you know, relationship. So I think we'll have to be very nimble about navigating these allegiances. Um, uh, and, and in a sense, you know, this multi-level engagement is the best way to do it. Now everyone's gonna have to be, um, pick up the pace a bit just because we're into the last few minutes. So if as quick answers as is possible, please, Rahul. Yes, to save time, I'll restrict myself to answering the first question on India, Inc. I was not very clear what was meant by comparison with the U.S. If it was meant that, like in Latin America or Mexico, the U.S. was not, Americans were not liked, or even in Europe or in Southeast Asia, there was some concern about the acquisitions from Japan. I don't think that's likely at all about India. I think India, Inc., unlike in the past, when uh, well-intentioned, very, but very badly implemented socialist policy created a closed and a shortage economy, and uh, we were all inefficient by and large. That's behind us. We need to do a great deal more, and we shall do more. But the Indian, India Inc. will now is facing the West already with a great deal of confidence. We have become, you know, of course, in the process of becoming, not becoming is a bad word, uh, uh, in the process of becoming internationally competitive. Uh, we are even acquiring companies abroad setting up plants abroad, and uh, we are doing it in the right way, if I may say so, by and large, because we are so diverse as a country in India, so somebody said we have 28 countries here, uh, that in acquisitions, and Chrysler and Fiat, an old acquisition by Fiat, uh, by Chrysler and uh, uh, Daimler, which was supposed to be a merger but had really become an acquisition, uh, you see, there were a lot of culture issues, and uh, many other acquisitions which failed were due to culture issues. And, and I think in the case of Indian companies acquiring companies abroad, uh, 
we have that advantage in terms of adjusting the cultures of the different organizations, which is a must. So I think India Inc. is very confident whether in importing and competing with things on our turf, because if we can't compete with them on our turf, how can we successfully compete with them on their turf? And without putting up a commercial, I now export 25% of my production uh, all over the world, so there is no problem at all. Shashi. Right, I'll try and be brief as well. First, on, on India Inc., just to say that when I travel, particularly, for example, in Africa, but also now in the Gulf, I go accompanied by India Inc., by large business delegations, 15, 18 business people, mainly private sector, a couple of public sector, and they're welcomed and they have discussions with their counterparts in governments as well as in the private sector in those countries. And the opportunities are there. It makes a big change from what some other countries do going in with a very heavy governmental footprint. We see our business in foreign policy as also being to facilitate the business of Indian companies. And that's a big difference in the way in which we're promoting our international cooperation. Uh, Vijay, why was I not elected UN Secretary General? Because the other guy got more votes. Uh, <laughs> on uh, Package's question about the GCCFTA, um, very frankly, I hear this in all my visits to GCC countries. Uh, we are very keen on an FTA with the GCC. There have been some foot dragging, but I don't believe the problem's only been on one side. Uh, however, we have, I mean, I have personally written to the Commerce Minister saying, let's do something more to move faster on this, because I'm hearing it from the other side. But I've equally said to the other side, maybe you folks also ought to look at why we haven't made this much progress. Talks have gone on for two years, and that's too long. We should be able to come to an FTA. Um, on human rights, Brad, I mean, I'm going to be very honest with you about this, uh, but because I'm going to have to be brief, if you feel my answer isn't complete, we can pursue it some other time. First of all, as a country that has only recently regained its sovereignty in the last 62 years, we have a great deal of respect for the sovereignty of other states. We're loath to infringe on them beyond a certain point. We accept and embrace the notion of a responsibility to protect, but be cautious as to how and how far it can be implemented and by whom and on what basis. Secondly, and similarly, as a country that for 200 years was the object of somebody else's civilizing mission, we're very loath to be attempting to impose our civilizational values on others. But at the same time, we're fundamentally attached to democracy, to transparency, and to human rights in our own way of organizing our own society. And we are not hesitant to point out that these values are actually an effective way of organizing a society. We have instinctive sympathies with other democracies. Uh, Rahul alluded earlier to our policy on, on Myanmar, which got us into all sorts of trouble with the military regime in that country after our overt support for Aung San Suu Kyi and the student movement in the early 90s. So there are certain tangible uh, consequences of expressing democratic sympathies. But as Pratap rightly pointed out, the way in which the human rights uh, issue is organized, the fact that you basically have human rights movement uh, advocates saying, we judge your human rights credentials, but whether you vote against certain countries in a body organized on the basis of, members, of member states of sovereign governments, for us, that is not, in fact, the best yardstick of judging a country's commitment to human rights. And our worry is precisely that since many of these countries that Western human rights advocates would like us to vote against are countries with which we have complicated and rather important relationships, that we seem to be asked almost uniquely to sacrifice our political and economic interests on the altar of somebody else's agenda. And this is a complicated matter. We are committed to human rights in our own country. We'd like to stand for the right values. We certainly do not applaud dictatorships, but at the same time, we don't accept this litmus test that the question appeared to be implying. Finally, the, the um, non-aligned, multi-aligned business. Sorry, I'm the one who came up with that word, multi-aligned. It's not a government of India formulation, so don't blame the government. I just came up with it while speaking to you all and a and, and little earlier. Just to stress, non-alignment was in a world that was divided very clearly between two camps, and we were the camp that refused to make a choice. There's a wonderful little apocryphal story of uh, an American Secretary of State saying to Jawaharlal Nehru, are you with us or against us? And Nehru replied, yes. <laughs> we're with you when we choose to be. We are against you when we choose. We will make our own choices, and we're not going to be committed to either camp. That world is gone. We're no longer a world divided into two hostile, warring superpowers. It's a world of, of, of multipolar world, as I said at the beginning of my remarks. And in that world, we do need various kinds of alignments as different ways of pursuing our interest. 
It's not to dilute our national interest in any way, as your question asked. It's finding different forums, different partners to pursue different aspects of our national interest. But having a number of different forums, which I refer to as multi-alignment, is not incompatible with our historical experience as an online state, is not incompatible with our neighborhood responsibilities. Indeed, we've also been shaped by 62 years of the practice of democracy. So we are a member of the Conference on Democracies as well. We've got all of that. They're just different ways and different forums of pursuing our interests around the globe. I'll just pick up one, which is this uh, question on the GCC to make a different, uh, another point, which is uh, India has navigated the global crisis quite well, and there are many reasons for it, among them what I call accidental Keynesianism. I mean, we ran a large fiscal deficit even before the crisis that helped. But when you look at the composition of our trade, while India opened up quite significantly to the world on the trade side, uh, if you look at the composition of trade, there was much greater, much less reliance on developed markets. And over the last 10 years, a very big shift in the composition of trade towards the GCC and even towards China. So the, uh, I, I, I mean, I think India is already moving uh, quite aggressively in that direction of more what we call South-South trade. And quite successfully, when you look at the composition compared to, compared to, let's say, even China itself, which is much more dependent on developed uh, country market. So I think the, 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 there are some lessons there for, you know, for, for broader uh, trade architecture as well. But f certainly for the GCC, if you look carefully at the numbers, there's been a huge increase. And as you rightly said, there could be a lot more. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay, very much. Thank you to all the panelists. I mean, I think I could safely predict this subject will be back next year. Uh, because I think what we're seeing is the early grappling with the concepts, the institutions, uh, the issues which are going to drive clearly a more assertive Indian foreign policy. Uh, and with a seat at the top table, I think we're hearing this afternoon, come responsibilities and challenges. The resentment of neighbors, the expectations that you're going to stand up to the plate on issues such as, as human rights, uh, the challenge of finding the right balance between, to use the old term, soft power and hard power in a world where uh, India is going to start bumping up against others. Uh, so, as I say, welcome to the first of what I suspect is going to be an annual highlight of the Indian uh, summit here, uh, which is Wither Indian Foreign Policy. Thank you.